Okay. <laughs> I didn't know the answer to this question. Let's start. Um, and that's supposed to say neck stiffness on the flyer. Sorry. So it was acute uh, unilateral vision loss with neck stiffness that our patient presented with. So um, this was uh, this is another case presentation, and I saw this patient on call on a Friday night. So without further ado. This was a nine-year-old girl who came into the ER at Primary Children's Hospital, and she was there with her mother. And the story was that she woke up four days prior to coming in with uh, decreased vision in her left eye, just sort of spontaneously. Um, this stayed the same for two days, and then it decreased again. So it was kind of a stepwise vision loss with two steps, if you will. Uh, and her description of it was that it was like she only had one eye. So she thought it was a pretty severe loss of vision. Uh, she also had pain with eye movement, but the pain wasn't there unless she was moving her eye. And from her perspective, her right eye was totally normal. Uh, according to the mom, the patient had had decreased energy for the past one and a half months. She was pretty confident in this because the patient had a twin sister with whom she was always running around the house. But for the past one and a half months, the sister was running around and the patient was just sitting on the couch. Uh, the patient had also had neck stiffness for five days. Uh, but this was actually improving. This was not on the downswing, so that was good news as well. And the mom had measured a temperature of up to 102 degrees Fahrenheit the week leading up to the presentation. So according to the mom, the patient was healthy otherwise. Mother thinks that the patient had a history of maybe a lazy eye. She wasn't really sure. But for, for this reason, the patient was followed by an ophthalmologist every couple years. And nine months previously, uh, she'd had an eye exam that, according to the mother, was completely normal. So whatever had happened seemed to have resolved. She also had a right inguinal hernia repair at age four. Family history was significant for diabetes, macular degeneration, unfortunately glioblastoma. Uh, and she had a 16-year-old brother who had walking pneumonia three months prior to her presentation. Social history was significant for multiple siblings. She lives with her parents and siblings locally. Uh, she started the fourth grade four days prior to coming in. She doesn't have any cats or dogs, but she does play with a neighborhood dog, so she is around. Uh, at least one animal. And she went camping in the Rocky Mountains the week prior to presentation, was bitten by a lot of mosquitoes, but as far as I know, was not bitten by any ticks. Uh, she does take multivitamins, not allergic to anything, and she's never left the country. So on physical exam, on near card uncorrected, she was 20-20 in the right eye and hand motion at five feet in the left eye. And she had a very significant APD of 2.4 log units. So at this point, I was thinking, oh boy, Friday night starting off well. <laughs> um, she had uh, normal intraocular pressures, extraocular motility was normal. Um, visual field was full to confrontation in the right eye and color vision was normal in the right eye but she was unable to really do those tests in the left eye. Her tail was normal as well. So on slit lamp, her anterior segments were normal and her dilated fundus exam was normal with the exception of stage three disc edema in the left eye but also stage two disc edema in the right eye in spite of her not claiming to have any problems with her right eye. So uh, she didn't have any hemorrhages or cotton wool spots around her nerves in either eye. So she'd actually been in to see her pediatrician the day prior for this myriad of symptoms. And that pediatrician worked through primary children, so we had access to some of the labs that he had ordered. She had a leukocytosis that was predominantly neutrophils. Uh, her CMP was normal. Um, and he ordered a number of other tests, including Epstein-Barr virus serology, for which the early antigen IgG came back negative, nuclear uh, IgG came back negative, and I'll go through what these tests mean. Um, viral capsid antigen IgM was negative, and the VCA IgG was positive. That stays positive for life, so it doesn't necessarily mean an acute infection. Um, and her ANA, TSH, T4 were all normal, as was her antistreptolysin O. So we ordered an MRI with and without contrast. It showed enhancement of the left optic nerve from the post bulbar area all the way back to the chiasm, and also enhancement of the right optic nerve at the annulus of the Zim. So this also argued for bilateral involvement of whatever this process was. Uh, it showed no other abnormalities of her brain, which was good news. So these are just a couple of slides. You can see some enhancement of the nerve through here. And then on a coronal image, the left nerve is obviously enhanced when compared to the right. So the question is, what do you do in this situation? Um, an infectious etiology was higher on her list given her systemic complaints. Sorry, I didn't mention she did have neck stiffness on exam and she was not febrile in the emergency department. But 
given the mother's history, the patient's general exam, her malaise recently, we thought a systemic infectious process was probably at work. Uh, but we also thought that she had an optic neuritis, which we wanted to treat with steroids, but we didn't want to make whatever this process was worse uh, for fear of really bad consequences in the end. So in the end, a lumbar puncture was performed and she was admitted to the neurology service. They were really helpful. We worked together on this patient for close observation until we had a little more information on what was going on. So some of the early results of her lumbar puncture, which was done that night, were a normal opening pressure, an increased white cell count of 100 in her CSF, which was 60% lymphocytes, uh, and then normal glucose with protein. So the next day, she was examined at the slit lamp, and she was 20-20 in her right eye and no light perception in her left eye. So this was not moving in the right direction. <laughs> she was still not febrile. Uh, she didn't seem to be getting any worse from a systemic standpoint. So it was decided at that point, since she was under close observation, it would be best to start a steroid treatment to see if we could help with her uh, optic neuritis, especially since the right nerve was involved as well, and we didn't know if that was going to start going downhill soon or not. So she was started on three days of IV steroids with a plan of a 10-day steroid oral taper after that. And in the meantime, we waited for labs to come back, and we ordered quite a number of them. I won't list every one of them out loud, but these are, these are a lot of them that came back negative. We Oh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> um, that was that was the key. Uh, so she had, a, a, you know, negative, lots of things: um, enterovirus, West Nile, Lyme disease, calf scratch disease. I didn't mention her. Uh, pediatrician also ordered an ESR, which was elevated at 25, and that was still elevated at 17, but it was at least trending down. But one thing that did come back positive was the CSF Epstein Barr virus PCR. So that. Uh, is indicative of an active infection with Epstein-Barr virus. So we thought that was, that was our answer at that point. Um, I don't think that came back the next day. I think that took a couple days to come back. But when it did come back, it was really helpful for us as far as what was going on with this patient. So uh, she was followed up three days later at the end of her IV steroid uh, portion of her regimen. And her vision was still 20-20 in the right eye, and it actually improved from no light perception to 20-30 in the left eye. So that was a huge improvement uh, for this patient. Her, she still had an afferent pupillary defect. It had increased, or it had improved from about 2.4 to about 1. Um, she still had disc edema in both eyes, but it improved from 3 to 2 in the left and 2 to 1 in the right. And she actually, this was Monday at this point, so we got a visual field that showed a full field in the right eye and an enlarged blind spot with a supranasal scotoma in the left eye. So that was her initial visual field after three days of IV steroid treatment. So a little bit about uh, the, some of the basics of the labs that I just mentioned, and then I'll go into uh, more detail on what happened with our patient and Epstein-Barr virus-induced optic neuritis. Um, the most common lab finding for an Epstein-Barr virus infection is a lymphocytosis or over half of a peripheral smear being lymphocytes, which actually wasn't the case in our patient. She had a predominantly neutrophilic leukocytosis. Uh, you can also find atypical lymphocytes uh, in the smear, which a lot of times with a, an automated count, it'll mark atypical lymphocytes and flag it as something that should be counted manually. That also didn't happen with our patient. Heterophile antibodies can be helpful, although in one study I read, they are much, much less sensitive and specific for children. That study looked at patients under the age of four, so I'm not sure how applicable it is to our patient at the age of nine. I don't know if that's a, a spectrum or if there's sort of a more of a cutoff at some age when they become more helpful. At any rate, I came across one uh, case study where a patient came in with Epstein Barr or with optic neuritis, and his MHATP came back positive, and it was thought that he had syphilis, and he was admitted for IV penicillin and all of his other tests come coming back negative, like the RPR and FDA ABS. And in the end, it was a false positive because of uh, reaction with the heterophile antibody. So that's something to keep in mind, because both of those diseases can cause optic neuritis. And um, if this is the only test coming back positive for syphilis, this, this could be the answer. Viral capsid antigen was one of the tests that our patient had. IgG and IgM are usually present at the start of clinical illness, but there's a uh, a long incubation period in the order of months. So uh, 
is usually not present during the clinical or during the in incubation period. The IgM tends to disappear after a few months and the IgG is present for life, which is what our patient had positive. The IgM can be present for other viruses as well. The nuclear antigen shows up a little bit later, six to 12 weeks after the onset of symptoms. So the argument in the paper that I was reading for this was that if you have a positive nuclear antigen right when a patient's symptoms start, it could be that this is from an old infection and you should be looking for a different etiology of their problems. Uh, this might not be the answer. At any rate, um, none of these antigen tests are necessarily present for all patients. In fact, a lot of patients will only have one or two come back positive, and that can have different prognostic indications as well, as I'll go through later. Early antigens are also present at the start of clinical illness if they're present at all. IG anti IgA antibodies were not ordered on our patient. That's more of a new test. One study found that they were positive, and 15 out of 15 patients found to be infected with Epstein-Barr virus, but I don't, I don't think that it's as commonly used yet as the other studies. PCR um, is the only one of these that's truly indicative for sure of an active infection. Um, it's more often positive in seronegative patients, interestingly, uh, and if you get a quantitative PCR, it can actually be indicative of other things going on like lymphadenopathy, lymphocyte numbers, and aminotransferase levels. It correlates with those. So with our patient, with her symptoms, lab values, family history, everything going on, we thought that this all made sense. It matched up. She had what seemed like a monoprodrome followed by optic neuritis. Everyone was happy with how she was doing. She was discharged to complete her oral steroid follow and follow up with Dr. Katz in a few weeks. And then unfortunately, she got worse. <laughs> so she came back with hand motion vision in the left eye. She had finished her steroid taper six days prior. Uh, so it was decided to readmit her, start her back on another uh, three-day regimen of IV steroids, followed by a much more drawn-out uh, oral steroid taper with the thought that maybe she didn't get enough of a taper the first time around. Um, this time, she had no systemic signs of infection. Her malaise had gone away. She wasn't having fevers anymore. Her neck stiffness was gone. Um, infectious disease was consulted, and they decided to start IV gancyclovir uh, in case the active Epstein-Barr virus infection just wasn't getting better. So while she was admitted this time around, we wanted to make sure we weren't missing anything else. She got a CT and L spine MRI, which all came back normal. Uh, her brain MRI was done on the last visit, so we didn't repeat that. Uh, she had CSF and plasma Epstein-Barr virus PCR, which actually this time was not detectable, so happily enough, it seems like her actual infectious process was over, which went along with her systemic signs. Um, but she still had this optic neuritis. So infectious disease was happy to stop the gancyclovir at that point. Um, she only got one day of it. Those tests came back quickly. Um, and her protein glucose uh, were normal again. She had an elevated white count this time around still. It was a lot lower than last time, and it was still predominantly lymphocytic. So. There's not a huge amount. There, there were some large studies on the effects of Epstein-Barr virus on the central nervous system, and really they just mentioned that it can cause optic neuritis. So the only detailed um, reports that I could come, up, come across were case reports, and I was just going to go through some of my findings from those. Um, typically, this will present with a prodrome of, or well, not typically, a decent amount of the time <laughs> from the case reports that I read. The patients will have a prodrome of fatigue, fever, cough, headache, weeks to months prior to coming in. So that can be a sign, as it was with our patient, that something more systemic is going on. The vision seemed to improve in these patients, uh, although if other central nervous system problems are present, like paralysis or hearing loss, which some of the patients had, those problems don't seem to get better as frequently, unfortunately. Um, IV steroids do tend to help patients to a more speedy recovery. As far as I could tell, there were no studies on this, but that was the impression I got from reading these reports. Um, but some authors think that you run the risk of worsening an active infection. Do, do they have evidence for that? They don't, and I, I was going to talk about that a little bit. Theoretical. That's all theoretical, very much so. So um, I was going to go through a few specific cases partly to illustrate that question there. Uh, one group saw um, a 49-year-old man who had simultaneous Guillain-Barre syndrome with optic neuritis, and he came in with light perception vision in the right eye. So all of these patients tend to have 
pretty dramatic vision decrease uh, with, with this type of optic neuritis. He was initially treated with three days of IV steroids and the Guillain-Barre syndrome worsened. Unfortunately, they didn't give a visual acuity after those three days. He was then started on IVIG for a total of five days of treatment with that. His visual acuity only improved Count Kanga's vision at that point. And then 35 days later, uh, his visual acuity was about 20-30 and his Guillain-Barre syndrome had improved. They don't really give any information in the interim and, and these authors argued that uh, steroids and IVIG would be beneficial but I'm not entirely sure I agree with them here because for one, the patient didn't seem to improve all that much with the steroids and IVIG. Uh, he seemed to improve, in, in my opinion, more on his own after the treatment regimen was stopped. And also, I, I don't know that the steroids as far as his vision was concerned, were, were given the more standard treatment regimen, which is to include an oral steroid taper after the IVIG. Uh, and we don't know what his vision was after the first three days. So uh, that was their argument. It was the only time that I came across that IVIG was used, um, but I'm, I don't know that I would go that route from the other reports that I was reading. I don't think they were specific, so I, yeah, I, th I think it was pulled. Um, there was another report with a 32-year-old woman with uh, neuromyelitis optica with initial hand motion vision in both eyes. She was treated with the more standard three days of IV steroids followed by an oral taper. Two weeks later, her vision was 20-30 in both eyes, and she had no improvement with her paraplegia after six weeks of follow-up. So. That was sort of what I was alluding to. A lot of these patients, their other problems don't improve as well as their vision does. Um, these authors were some of the authors that speculated that CNS-induced problems by Epstein-Barr virus are of immune etiology rather than a direct effect of infection. And I think our case is helpful in that regard because we finally have a case where we had an active infection. We, we were pretty confident that this was an Epstein-Barr virus-induced optic neuritis. And then she came back with, I don't know if you would call it a relapse because I don't know that she ever completely recovered, but she certainly got worse and we had evidence with a repeat PCR that the infection was no longer present. So I, I think that's an argument toward the uh, idea that this is an immune uh, etiology, not direct infection of the central nervous system causing the Epstein-Barr virus infection. Um, these authors were also some of the authors that highlighted that they might be more hesitant to just throw steroids at these patients because of the risk of worsening an active infection. This is only one case, but this was one case where she was treated with steroids and presumably while being treated, her PCR went from positive to negative. So it didn't seem to cause her harm in that area. Obviously it's a sample size of one, but um, it is an argument, I think, that steroids can be beneficial for these patients without necessarily causing them further harm. Uh, Another group, this, this patient was a little bit different. This was an eight-year-old girl who had ulcerative colitis and sclerosing cholangitis who had a liver transplant for these reasons. Prior to the transplant, she, was, she had serology that was positive for Epstein-Barr virus and the status of her donor was unknown. After the transplant, she was immunosuppressed with cyclosporine, azathioprine, and prednisone. Uh, and she was found to be positive for uh, EBV a year after the transplant. She was started on amcyclovir for this reason and her PCR never did become negative. It just fluctuated up and down over the years. At the age of 13, she came in with worsening left eye pain, was found to have an APD and 2065 vision in the left eye. She had an MRI done which showed left optic nerve enhancement along with multiple uh, lesions along the corpus callosum and periventricular region. Similar to our patients, she had a myriad of tests done. Everything came back negative other than the Epstein-Barr virus test, which was already known to be positive. So she had been put on gamcyclovir for fear of CMV. That was stopped. Um, her steroids were adjusted and her visual acuity resolved and she had a residual APD. Unfortunately, she came back six months later with fever fatigue and cervical lymphadenopathy with similar lesions and no evidence this time of optic neuritis. She had her lymph nodes biopsied and they uh, came back positive for CD20 uh, B cells and she was diagnosed with post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. A year later, she developed headache, tonic-clonic seizures. She came in with more lymphadenopathy throughout her body. 
she had patchy white matter lesions consistent with CNS lymphoma. She had bilateral optic disc edema and pallor, and she was started on chemotherapy and eventually transitioned to um, more of a hospice type care, and she passed away. So it's a sad story, but the author's point is that this could have been, this optic neuritis could have been the initial presentation of this post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. Obviously, this patient is a different demographic than ours. She's immunosuppressed. She's had uh, systemic problems before. But they, they argue that in an immunosuppressed patient, particularly a patient who's had a transplant prior, uh, it's important to keep other more malignant uh, etiologies on the differential for these patients. I, I don't think that there was a high suspicion of anything like this in our patient, but uh, this was the first time they think that uh, the optic neuritis was the first uh, presenting sign of an Epstein-Barr virus-induced post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. And I also included her because she had a positive PCR, which our patient did, and there was only one other case that I came across that did. Uh, this was a 24-year-old man who had the positive PCR along with positive DCA antibodies. He had a number of other problems, including um, mental st altered mental status, facial paresis, uh, left lateral rectus weakness, hearing loss, impaired finger to nose, and neck stiffness as well. He was actually not started on steroids. He stayed in the hospital for three weeks, essentially being observed as far as I can tell, and his visual acuity returned to his baseline. He did have residual facial paresis and hearing loss, but he was one of two cases that I came across who did not receive, receive any form of steroid treatment or other treatment, and both of those patients seemed to recover quite well as far as their vision is concerned but both of them did seem to take a little longer than the majority of the other patients to get back to their baseline. So a summary of the other cases, I won't go through all of them, but I, I came across 10 cases, nine plus the one that, that I saw. Eight out of the 10 patients were male. Uh, five of the cases had unilateral optic neuritis and five had other neurologic findings, so there was no real trend there. When I say neurologic findings, I, I included things like deficits like uh, paralysis or uh, hearing loss. I didn't include things like uh, neck stiffness. Um, six of the patients had prodromal symptoms, so not a huge trend in that direction. And three of the patients had a positive PCR. Eight out of 10 had some form of steroid treatment. A, a lot of the regimens were different from one another. And five had what I called a complete visual recovery, uh, including the two that did not have steroid treatment. When I say complete visual recovery, most of these patients didn't have things like color vision reported, so I'm not sure if they had residual visual field deficits or color vision deficits, but their visual acuity returned to their baseline. Um, so to be specific, that's what I meant by visual recovery. So our patient was seen most recently five and a half months after her initial presentation, and her vision at that visit was 2015 in both eyes with uh, perfect color vision, perfect stereo vision, just a slight APD. Her disc showed a tiny bit of pallor uh, temporally in the left eye. And actually, I don't think it was a tiny bit. I think I'm being too optimistic there. I think she did have temporal pallor in the left eye. Uh, her visual fields were normal in each eye, and she feels like she's doing great. She doesn't have any problems anymore. Um, partway through her visits, this is her RNFL OCT, which is consistent with the temporal pallor in that left eye. Um, so just a couple final comments on uh, the prognosis for this patient. Uh, so Epstein or optic neuritis in a child um, can have other prognostic implications. As most people here know, uh, the optic neuritis treatment trial looked at uh, prognosis for patients with uh, optic neuritis in terms of whether their chances of developing multiple sclerosis down the road, along with many other things. And the general trend there was that if you have findings on an MRI, in addition to findings of optic neuritis, you have a higher chance of developing multiple sclerosis. Uh, there have been some smaller studies that looked at children with the same sort of a question. One of them, as an example, was a study in 2009 that was a retrospective study of children with idiopathic optic neuritis, which doesn't entirely apply to our patient because hers was not idiopathic, but to dangerously extrapolate. Uh, she, three out of 18 of these patients had uh, multiple sclerosis after two years of follow-up. <laughs> Um, three out of seven of them developed it if they had other findings on an MRI, and only zero, well, zero out of 11 developed multiple sclerosis with uh, an otherwise normal MRI. And the trend was continued in a meta-analysis done a couple of years later with similar studies. So 
uh, not as many patients in these studies, but the trend seems to be similar, that if your MRI doesn't show other abnormalities, then you stand less of a chance to develop multiple sclerosis. Uh, an interesting study that I came across looked at patients in northern Sweden, which is, you know, an area where multiple sclerosis is much more common, and they actually had a, a registry of patients' serum that they studied, and they did a, a huge amount of tests. Um, they probably did do the, was it the porphyrin test, Dr. Olson, that I missed? <laughs> they probably did that one as well. Um, but they... Uh, they had a group of prospective cases and retrospective cases. Prospective cases were patients who did not have multiple sclerosis. Some of them went on to develop it, some of them did not. The retrospective cases were patients who all had already developed multiple sclerosis. And in both of these groups, they found that a high EBNA1, uh, one of the early nuclear antigen tests, um, correlated with an increased risk for multiple sclerosis. But interestingly, if you have a positive viral capsid antigen antibody, you have less of a chance of developing multiple sclerosis. So this also argues in our patient's favor. She had the positive VCA, but the negative EBNA. I think, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. I do, I, I do remember the difference for the EBNA was larger than the VCA, but I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact number. Um, That's true. That's true. That's true. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the specific numbers. They did mention in their study that similar findings came about with rheumatoid arthritis in a study done in Germany, but I don't have those numbers either. Um, and. They also showed a latency period um, between people who did develop multiple sclerosis who had previous Epstein-Barr virus infection. There was a latency period of years uh, for the most part between those two disease processes. But uh, Dr. Katz and Dr. Uh, Kyung, along with the rest of the neuro-ophthalmology department, were very helpful with this patient. And uh, that's about all I have. Are there any other questions? Yes. <laughs> And I think I think that's 
<laughs> and I think, I think that's a real key point in this series of patients because the truth is the people treated with steroids did, a lot of them got better, but there were two patients that I came across who had no steroid treatment and their visual acuity was great at the end of the day. Well, um, well the other And that, that was, like I said, it was a very small sample size, but that was my impression of the trend, just looking at these 10 cases, was that. But then you ask yourself, if you were more given the idea that you're supposed to be in the team, would you be more comfortable with the team? Would you be more comfortable with I was thinking about that, too. Yeah, I'm not going to change it. That, that's, that's exactly what we did with this patient, too. You know, she went from count fingers vision to NLP, and we said, oh, let's, let's do something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, and, and I, didn't, I didn't come across, we, we talked with infectious disease about that, and I didn't come across previous cases where the patient was treated with an active antiviral other than the immunosuppressed patient that I mentioned. Um, and infectious disease at least thought the second time around, because she got worse, that it would be worth starting one the second time around. I don't had, I didn't come across evidence for or against that when I was reading. I. I guess from what I read, if you're confident that it's the Epstein-Barr virus that's causing the problem, I feel like it's probably okay to withhold the antiviral because 10 out of 10 of these patients didn't seem to have a worsening 
I guess I take that back. That one, that one, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's hard. I don't know. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 